You may think you're in complete control of your life, but what if I told you your every move was being manipulated by the very organizations that claim to protect you? From the sneaky and subtle to the big and bold, here are some of the downright scariest ways that governments control your behavior. <laughs> Student Spies You might not have heard much about Turkmenistan, the Middle Eastern country bordering Iran and Afghanistan. However, it has one of the most repressive regimes in the world. News that isn't vetted and controlled by the Turkmen government is completely banned, and the internet is heavily censored. That means no Instagram, Twitter, and heaven forbid, YouTube. Crafty university students have found workarounds utilizing illegal VPNs to access the wider web. But the government knows this and has come up with a terrifying solution forcing professors to spy on their own students. That's right, and if they don't comply, they could lose their job. The snooping doesn't stop at the country's borders though. The secretive state sweet talks students into studying abroad with promises of financial aid, and then bam, forces them to spy on their classmates as well. Every single overseas dorm of Turkmen students has at least one informant, and each are given a list of fellow students to spy on. The whole messed up situation has led to intense distrust among Turkmen students, and who can blame them? Literally anybody they talk to could be working for the government. It gets even more bizarre when you read some of the notes made by the student spies. One wrote, a student received low grades, therefore he should be questioned. Low grades, really? It makes you wonder how many of the so-called informants just make things up to punish people they don't like. Man, bullies are bad enough as it is without being given government powers. Big Brother is watching you. It might sound like something out of George Orwell's 1984, but sinister posters of the government's ever watchful eye aren't limited to fiction. Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez died in 2013, but that hasn't stopped him from watching over the Venezuelan people. Shortly after his death, Chavez's eyes, known to locals as Los Ojos de Chavez, started appearing all over the country, on walls, billboards, and steps. Of course, Chavez himself can't be responsible. So who is? Perhaps surprisingly, they're the work of his successor, Nicolas Maduro, who adopted the design in his 2013 election campaign. Chavez has been a popular leader, and he kept a historically rebellious people relatively untroublesome. Maduro claimed that by propagating the image, he was showing that he shared Chavez's ideals, but the truth is far more sinister. The eye's real purpose is to keep the country's population obedient and scared. You see, there's a lot of power in a pair of eyes. Researchers at Newcastle University in the UK put up two different posters in a restaurant, reminding people to clear away their trash. On one day, the posters had flowers on them, and on the next, they had a pair of staring eyes. On the day people were subjected to the peeking peepers, they were twice as likely to do what the poster said. So next time you want somebody to do something for you, try steering them into submission. There's no way it can backfire, right? Speaking of watching things through, if you love watching my channel, you should really hit those like and subscribe buttons. That way, you'll never miss any of my amazing new videos. Go on, you won't regret it. Anyway, scary social credit. Credit scores are pretty common around the world. If you pay your bills on time and do your taxes, your credit score goes up and banks are more willing to lend you money. Seems fair. China's social credit system is way more invasive though where having a low score affects every single part of your life. Plus, everything from posting on social media to buying too many video games could lower that score. Man, I'd be in jail in no time. In 2018 alone, 5.5 million Chinese citizens were banned from trains just because of their scores. But even if you have a good score, it's no guarantee you won't be punished. One unlucky student was suspended from university because of his dad's bad behavior. Jeez. Punishing a son for his father's actions? That's messed up, but you can guarantee it ensures compliance. Speaking of families, your social credit score can also plummet if you don't visit your parents often enough. This is because Chinese culture is rooted in Confucianism, the fundamental belief that parents can do no wrong. So it doesn't matter if your mom's so evil the devil sold his soul to her, you've still got a visitor. And don't think sending your brother will work Facial recognition cameras are all over the place. So much so that the state says it can find your exact location in as little as seven minutes. Man, I've heard of the nanny state, but this is more like the overbearing mother state. 
Cacti Spy. If you're ever unfortunate enough to get lost in the desert and feel like the cacti are watching you, well, it might not just be the dehydration. Over in Paradise Valley, Arizona, the cacti really do watch you. Back in 2015, the government built giant metal replicas of the plants and installed secret cameras inside them, designed to slyly read vehicles' license plates. Sneaky. City officials say the succulent surveillance only checks for stolen vehicles, but they know its presence puts people off speeding too. And cacti haven't just been used to hide cameras either. Elsewhere in Arizona, they hide whopping grade cell towers. Before you grab your tinfoil hat though, hold on. These towers don't brainwash you with their 5G powers. They don't need to. They influence your emotional response instead. I mean, if the government built an ugly metal tower outside your house, you'd be pretty miffed, right? However, if it looked like a friendly plant, you'd be far less likely to complain to your local council. And governments really don't want you complaining, so they disguise their comings and goings whenever possible. This parking lot palm tree in San Diego is another example. I'm not so sure about this tower, though. It looks more like a giant toilet brush than a tree. Do they really believe that's fooling anyone? Pretty Pink Prisons when you think of prison, you probably imagine orange jumpsuits and gray center block walls. However, the reality can be a little rosier than that, but not because jail is fun or anything. For a surprising reason, prison walls are sometimes painted pink. Back in 1979, psychologist Alexander Schaus came up with a crazy theory that the color pink makes you weak. To test his hypothesis, he asked 153 men to stare at a pink card, then lift some weights. After this, they were asked to stare at a blue card and do the same. Astonishingly, Schaus found that over 98% of the men were significantly weaker after seeing the pink card. What's more, he later discovered that a certain shade of pink, called Baker Miller, had a calming effect on angry prisoners after just 15 minutes in a pink detention cell. So together, the color could make people both weaker and more subdued. Word got around and prison managers started painting their jail cells pink in an effort to make their convicts better behaved. Inmates in Maricopa County Jail, Arizona were even forced to wear pink underwear, though there was no evidence that calmed them down. In fact, nobody has ever successfully recreated Schaus's original results, and one study even showed that prisoners in pink cells became more aggressive in the long term. I guess the prison guards won't be tickled pink at that news. Hidden Hostility If the unthinkable happened and you lost your home, at the very least you could catch some shut-eye on a bench, right? Well, not if the government has anything to do with it. Cities like Washington, D.C. have installed extra arms on their benches to make it impossible to take a snooze on them. We call this hostile architecture, and governments around the world use it to keep groups they see as undesirable out of public view, like the homeless. This bench outside London's Royal Courts of Justice is particularly nefarious in its design. Sure, solid stone is a good idea to protect pedestrians from vehicles, but see those thin metal strips? They're only there to prevent people from lying down. Not that it actually stops anyone sleeping, it just forces rough sleepers to go to more dangerous areas, making them even more vulnerable. And architects love getting creative with the ways they can displace people. From ridge seats to, yep, no seats at all, these benches are barbaric and people are understandably outraged that their cities are installing them. One artist called Nadia Kavi Link protested against hostile architecture in Bruges, Belgium by installing this satirical spike bench there. It's obviously not meant to be sat on. Thousands of pens don't make for great seats, but is it really much worse than some of the other examples we've seen? Hopefully, the local governments will get the point. Streetlight Surveillance With one security camera for every six people, the U.S. has the most CCTV per person of any country in the world. You'd think there'd be no space left for more cameras then, right? But in 2017, the city of San Diego in California said, just watch me. In an effort to improve transport around the city, the local government set up hidden cameras inside streetlights. Okay. The idea was that by monitoring the flow of traffic, they could gain data to improve the roads. It didn't take long, however, for the spy lights to be used for other means. The police quickly realized they were perfect for surveillance, and by August 2020, they'd tapped into over 400 of the hidden cams. So despite a non-invasive original aim, they were repurposed into a scarily vast and covert state surveillance system. And across the pond in Britain, the lampposts don't just watch you, they listen to you too. 
In 2010, several British cities bugged their streetlights with a microphone that could, wait for it, detect aggressive language. That's right, if somebody sounded angry or distressed, the mic sent a signal to a nearby camera which would zoom in on the direction the voice came from. Whoa! What do you think of all this? Are streetlight cams a useful way of preventing crime or a creepy breach of human privacy? Let me know in the comments down below. Placebo buttons. Okay, so governments all over the place seem dead set on controlling their people's behavior, but surely something as simple as pushing a button to cross the street is outside of their influence, right? Wrong. In New York City, a whopping 91% of those crosswalk buttons aren't hooked up to anything. Yep, the traffic lights are actually just on a timer to keep the roads moving predictably. So why bother with buttons at all if they don't work? Turns out it's basic psychology. People like to feel in control, and if we feel like we're in control of the traffic, we're more likely to wait before crossing the road. Which means less people are turned into crush cafeteria meatloaf. And that's great and everything, but it really freaks me out how easily we're influenced by something as simple as a button press. So yeah, <laughs> um, like and subscribe, right? Alexa alerts. A lot of governments spy on their citizens. While most are fairly subtle about it though, some have all the subtlety of a brick to the face. Like the British Home Office, who decided to collaborate with Amazon to track people's online purchases. Brits who'd recently bought candles found their smart speakers suddenly started spouting government fire safety advice at them. Now, there's nothing wrong with wanting people to be safe from fires, but there is something inherently creepy about tracking people's activity without their permission. Who knows what else they could have been looking at. And in the US, things are equally suspicious. Will Bauer from South Carolina decided to ask his Alexa straight up if it was spying on him. Alexa, are we currently being monitored by the NSA? The NSA is the US National Security Agency, so it's super creepy that Alexa refused to answer. Amazon says it's only a glitch, but if you're still dubious, I've got just the solution for you. The disembodied head of NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden. Don't worry, it's not actually his head, but it is a stylishly slip-on cover that blocks Alexa's microphone, ensuring it can't snoop on you. Oh, sorry, did I say stylish? I meant utterly traumatizingly terrifying. Fake fire hydrants. In New York City, you can be fined $115 for parking by a fire hydrant. After all, they're there to save lives, not save you a prime parking spot. But did you know a load of those hydrants don't even work? And for 15 years, the government still charged people for parking by them? You see, at the turn of the 20th century, buildings in the Big Apple were getting taller, which meant its fire hydrants needed to be more powerful to reach the upper floors. So in 1904, the government installed a new high-pressure system of fire hydrants known as stubbies. They worked for a time, but after a few decades, more modern hydrants were installed, making the stubbies obsolete. Despite being decommissioned, though, the hefty 600-pound stubby stayed firmly put for many years. I mean, that's a whole 100 pounds more than Arnie could bench at his peak. Rather than despairing at this wasted space, though, the NYC Council saw dollar signs and continued to find people for parking by them. Pretty deceitful, right? Those stubbies were only there to manipulate you out of your hard-earned cash. Nowadays, most of the fake hydrants have finally been removed, but a few stragglers remain. There's one sure-fire way to find out if one works or not, though. Park by it. If it's real and a fire breaks out, this will happen. Turns out firemen care more about stopping fires than they do about your car. The owner's insurance sure isn't gonna cover that. No way, Jose. Little privacy, please. Nothing screams America like apple pie, 4th of July barbecues, and half-inch gaps in bathroom stalls so you can make awkward poopy eye contact with people. Wait, what? That's right. U.S. cubicles are way more exposed than other countries, and it's all to keep people in line. Supposedly, the peer pressure of being watched makes people behave better. Therefore, they're less likely to get up to any naughty business when they should be pooping. One thing I really can't get my head around, though, is this washroom in the Washington State Convention Center. With gaps under the doors that are higher than my ankles and enough space above the doors to fly a plane through, there's zero privacy from the washroom lobby. And it gets worse. Take a look at that huge cutout between each stall. Ugh, I've heard of love thy neighbor, but if this is what love looks like, then I'll pass. 
Tiny Terminators Every country dealt with the coronavirus pandemic in their own way, but the nation of Singapore had a uniquely dystopian way of enforcing its social distancing rules. Robots. Okay, so it's not quite the Terminator, but this guy is still a scary sign of government enforcement. The bots are set to patrol busy spaces, barking out orders for people to stay apart. They're not just fancy speaker systems though. Each comes equipped with seven cameras and an inbuilt artificial intelligence designed to spot so-called undesirable behavior. Anybody not abiding by the strict rules will face swift consequences. The bots notify real police officers who quickly appear on the scene. When you consider that in Singapore you can be jailed for three whole years just for logging into someone else's Wi-Fi, it really makes you wonder what the government will do next. Build an army of internet defending robot dogs? Managed and measured. It's in a government's best interest to have a healthy population. A fitter, longer living populace contributes more to society and generates more income for a country. Japan is hyper aware of this and as such has one of the lowest obesity rates in the world. At just 4%, it's 10 times less than the US's. This impressively low figure is partially down to a controversial law that Japanese government introduced in 2008. It's called the Metabo Law, after metabolic syndrome, which is a cluster of conditions caused by excess body fat. What actually is it? Well, employers are required to measure the waistlines of all employees over the age of 40. If the men's waistline exceed 33 and a half inches or the women's exceed 35.4 inches, they are forced to attend weight loss counseling sessions. Crikey. Essentially, the government is using the fear of shame to stop its citizens overeating. And any employer that refuses to carry out the humiliating measurements can be fined for their disobedience, so there's no escaping the ordeal. As demeaning as it may be though, there's no denying the results. The average American man has a waistline almost seven inches over Japan's limit. And American women average over three inches more. So over half of all US adults would fail the test. What do you reckon? Is the measuring worth it in the fight against obesity or has Japan took it too far? Let me know down in the comments. Mind control music. Nobody likes being put on hold when they're on the phone and the irritating music is one of the worst parts. Did you know there's a devious reason for that music though? It's actually used by governments and other organizations to keep you waiting around for longer. Believe it or not, we're more likely to stay on hold if there's music than if there's something like a pre-recorded voice message. So wait, do people actually like that tedious 30 second loop? Not quite. Music influences the way we view time, so even if the tune's objectively terrible, it can still trick us into thinking we've been on hold less than we really have. I guess time flies when you're having absolutely no fun at all. And music has been used for other nefarious reasons too. Back in the 80s, behavioral expert Dr. Hal Becker experimented with adding subliminal messages to songs. By hiding barely audible words in the tracks, he theorized that he could change the behavior of the people who listened to them. Around 50 department stores in the US were so interested in the idea that they started pumping the special music into their elevators laced with subliminal anti-theft messages. Shockingly, it worked really well. Theft dropped a staggering 80% across the stores, leading Becker to suggest that governments could use the technique to keep crime rates down across the board. Despite the success of the music though, this didn't get adopted, or at least as far as I'm aware. Whoa, is the real reason I'm not a thief because I've been brainwashed into compliance? Cardboard Cop Cars From stop signs to speed bumps, governments around the world have tried just about everything to slow down speeding drivers. Officials in Turkey, however, have got particularly crafty about it. Instead of paying flesh and blood traffic cops to keep the road safe, the Turkish government have put out cardboard ones instead. Uh, what? You see, from a distance, it's tough to tell a genuine police car from its cardboard counterpart, so drivers slow down even though it's all fake. In fact, it's worked so well that crashes were slashed by 17% in just one year. The really scary part about this isn't the cardboard cars though, it's the people who still insist on speeding. Let's just hope they cop on soon. Toilet Troubles If you've ever been to the UK, you'll know needing to pee when you're out and about can be a real pain in the piddler. If there's a public toilet at all, it's often subject to a fee to use it. 
By sealing public restrooms behind a paywall, governments earn more tax dollars and don't have to spend so much money on bathroom maintenance. However, paywalled toilets have had other more startling consequences. One British study found over half of its participants intentionally dehydrated themselves when they went out just to dodge paying a bathroom fee. And another 20% avoided leaving the house altogether. It goes without saying, but dehydrating yourself is not healthy. And neither is staying in the house all day out of fear. Go back in time to mid-19th century Britain, though, and things were much different. Free public toilets were all over the place if you were a man, but if you were a woman, well, good luck. There were zilch. To reinforce now outdated gender roles, the government solely built public toilets for men. This meant women could only travel as far from home as their bladders let them, effectively leashing them to the domestic life. It wasn't until the 1880s that women were granted the basic right to take a pee outside of their homes, and even then it was only to get them to spend more time shopping. Jeez. Yep, if you were a woman in Victorian London, then you're in trouble. Well, that's just about all the scary forms of government control I can handle for now. Have you noticed any of them before? And are there any others you know about? Let me know down in the comments below, and thanks for watching.